wander through a world filled with very real objects, but are constantly confronted by the pernicious problem of consciousness. Perception is not a high-fidelity recreation of what is. It's an impressionistic version of the world that's filtered through the surface of the eardrum, the delicate membranes of the pupil, or the countless ridges that line the fingertips. Rather than directly experiencing the objects we encounter, our awareness relies on electrical signals that spread away from the point of contact. These signals are integrated by the brain into thoughts, feelings, and beliefs, a process that is deeply imperfect, and one that takes into account only a shadow of all that exists and occurs in a given moment. Under normal circumstances, the brain's processing is good enough. Sensory signals get parsed into action directives, and the occasional ambiguity that remains can be clarified through language, by checking in with those around you. Did you see that? Hey, what happened? But under the surface of a functional day-to-day, -day, there remains a difficult truth. The human brain isn't very good at ascertaining objective reality. That there isn't one version of reality is pretty obvious these days on Earth. Spend a few minutes on the internet or reading the news and it becomes obvious that folks are having wildly different experiences despite apparent similarities in their physical existences. One surprising area where this really seems to matter is in the world of healthcare and healing. On one hand, medicine is the shining achievement of modern humans. The technological ability to treat disease, disorders of the structure and function of the physical body, has never been greater. And yet, life expectancy for some of those living in the world's richest countries keeps creeping down. Researchers aren't exactly sure why that is. Like any good scientist, though, they've offered up many possibilities. The opioid epidemic, obesity, demographic conversion, COVID and associated stresses. The list goes on and on. It's likely these all contribute, but people living longer and those dying sooner share an objective physical reality. They wake up in the morning and go to work, raise their kids, spend time with their friends. So why the very different outcomes? Some scientists have suggested that it's all about how people interpret and respond to the events around them. For instance, the UK's Whitehall study back in the 60s followed 17,000 civil servants for a decade and found that those in lower status jobs died twice as often as those in administrative roles, even when controlling for a variety of risk factors. Princeton professors Ann Case and Angus Deaton named these deaths of despair. The hopelessness of economic hardships might be lethal. What's becoming increasingly clear is that the physical world, your body and its environment, is only half of the human story. The other half is about assessment, reaction, and what you will into occurring. This is a story of medicine, the mind, physical reality, and unreliable perception. But at the end, it's all about the good, the bad, and the ugly of what science has to say about the power of belief. Chapter 1. There's no such thing as objective, cognitive reality. Reality is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as the state of things as they actually exist. Dictionaries reflect the common usage, so this suggests that in common language, the word reality limits the discussion to the physical realm, since only objects with shapes and location can physically exist. But limiting the discussion of reality to physical objects throws a wrench into the gears of the science of consciousness, because science has a hard time studying subjective concepts. It's pretty good at stuff like chemistry, where a mechanism comes down to the interlocking of atoms, but... Is robust scientific analysis of something as personal as subjective experience even possible? Yes and no. Subjective experience will differ from person to person, but science now offers mechanistic explanations for how those experiences arise physiologically and how they affect people emotionally. And that's a huge paradigm shift from the popular materialist perspectives of the previous century. Modern scientists are increasingly curious about the effects of the mind on the health of the body. The expansion of scientific inquiry into the realm of consciousness comes after many decades of dismissing the question as a matter for philosophers rather than scientists. A laser focus on the actions of physical objects created a postmodernist movement that insisted there is no such thing as objective reality. In sequel to history, philosopher Elizabeth Deeds Ermuth suggests that humans no longer require an objective world. There is only subjectivity. There are only illusions, and every illusion because it has no permanently objectifying frame, constitutes reality, and hence is totally objective for its duration. Which is clearly nonsensical. In reaction to this postmodern swing of the pendulum, many scientists dug their heels in and insisted that only that which can be physically measured is worth considering. For this reason, we must tread carefully when flipping the coin of reality. 
There are whispers in the literature claiming hints at extraordinary feats of conscious intervention. Psychedelic experiences that end PTSD, faith healing that helps people walk again, and sham surgeries that work as well as real interventions. This points to the power of the mind in initiating and perpetuating illness. Some percentage of sickened patients aren't diseased. They have no physical ailment. Theirs is a functional illness where the mind has broken with the body. And then there are the examples of impossible feats in the other direction. Meditating monks that melt circles in the snow around them, Wim Hof practitioners that consciously control their immune systems. So how is science dealing with a shift in thinking that is going to rewrite the last century of textbooks? Chapter 2. More than a state of mind. True to the materialist roots of science, the first step being made toward understanding conscious control of health is the mapping of the brain. The human brain is thought to have on the order of 100 billion neurons, and somewhere around 125 trillion connections between them. And somewhere at the center of that tangle, scientists hope to find the place where the objective deforms into the subjective. And although the Connectome project still has many years to go, there's enough on the table that we can start to assemble a working model. Before they reach the cortex, the sulcusated center of cognition, signals from outside the body come into the brainstem and the basal brain. There, basic processing systems control the body's autopilot. Posture, breathing, eye movement, taste, facial sensation, regulation of the central nervous system, and sleep. The cerebellum, the structure down at the base of the neck that looks like a little brain, is a switchboard that helps coordinate motion, precision, and timing. None of this requires conscious thought. The structures and the connections within them are sufficient to keep the lights on. A little higher in the brain, closer to the cortex, things start to get interesting. The basal ganglia are responsible for voluntary movements, learning through habits and repetition, eye movements, and most importantly, for our purposes, emotional reactivity. As we discovered in conversation with Wim Hof researcher Dr. Vaibhav Dwadkar, the axis between the cortex and the deeper brain structures is how humans are able to affect the body in ways that science of the past didn't think was possible. The old model, where the brainstem reached into the cortex in order to cause cognition, didn't actually account for the way that mindset is able to feed back into the brainstem and affect all of the downstream systems. Wim Hof talks all the time about the ways in which your mind can make you feel good, how you can get high on your own supply, as he says, and how you can decrease inflammation just through breath. And the science, including the work of today's guest, immunologist Matthias Cox, has shown this to be the case. But what deserves a greater mention is the importance of expectation in success. You can Wim Hof breathe all night long, but if you don't think it's going to work, there's a really good chance it won't. Your beliefs about the world created as a result of your unique relationship to everything that's ever happened over the course of your life have a decisive effect on your well-being and the degree to which treatment will make you better or worse. What might come to mind at this point is the placebo effect, the well-known phenomenon that when the doctor gives you a sugar pill instead of a real pill, sometimes you can get better because you anticipate that you should. Placebo works better for some illnesses than others, though which suggests a significant psychological ideology that's being ignored in medicine. And it gets even stranger. Sham surgery, where you get put under, the surgeon cuts you open, but then just sews you up and sends you home, is as effective as real surgery in almost half of the cases examined by a team of researchers at Oxford for diseases such as sleep apnea, acid reflux, and GI bleeds. The act of treatment itself, of being touched, cared for, and being in the hands of someone who you believe can save you from a chaotic and strange world, eases suffering in measurable ways. Yep, we couldn't make this up. Check out the links in the description. Much of the research on placebo, though, is difficult to parse. Some of the studies show massive improvements, and others show more modest effects. Research coming out of Dr. Crumb's Mind and Body Lab at Stanford suggests that treatment alone isn't enough to have the desired effects. You really have to believe in your doctor. In one of her lab's experiments, they gave subjects a little prick of poison ivy and then sent them into a doctor's office. Patients that met a warm, competent doctor in an orderly office experienced a decreased histamine response when given a placebo. But those who encountered a cold, incompetent doctor in a messy office didn't respond to placebo at all. Negative beliefs can affect more than a response to treatment. They can actually cause the illness in the first place. Really. This is illustrated in the work of Dr. Suzanne O'Sullivan, an Irish neurologist who works with treatment-resistant epileptics. 
she discovered early in her career that 70% of her patients, people who were having debilitating seizures, didn't have epilepsy at all. There was absolutely nothing physically wrong with them according to the -the state-of-the-art diagnostics. Their seizures and health problems were psychogenic. This is sickness that originates in the conceptual layers of the mind, rather than in the physical reality of the body. The science on the matter is far from settled, and so we have to be careful in what we say here. But it would appear that emotional and physical trauma, when left unresolved, can manifest in the body. Aches and pains that would be ignored in one person become the central focus in another. Under constant scrutiny, they expand, grow, and eventually become a full-blown illness that can't be treated with medicines because there's nothing wrong with the physical objects that the medicines target. Some researchers even believe that psychogenic illness can lead all the way to psychogenic death. First described in the 1950s as voodoo death by anthropologists studying indigenous tribes people in Australia, the phenomenon was modulated into a Western lens in the 1980s. Thought, emotion, and expectation are associated with and precede a great range of morbid conditions short of death. The giving up complex in which generally following an event perceived as stressful, a person feels unable to cope and has no expectation that any change in the environment is possible or will help. This cognitive and emotional complex affects neurally regulated biological emergency patterns, which in turn facilitate the onset of a variety of morbid conditions. Science writing has gotten a little better since then. The exploration of these subjects led to the development of a new field of study, psychophysiology, whose focus is to understand the power of the mind over the body. And so, in all of this, there's an obvious final question. Can mindset be physically contagious? Chapter 3. Social Contagion. We have now arrived at the bleeding edge of what is known in this mind-body health universe. So what comes next is highly speculative and should be taken with a grain of salt. The question is, if psychology affects the body, and given infectious disease is well described, could infectious psychogenic illness occur as well? It's hard to say because evaluations of contagious psychogenic illness are often undertaken with skepticism or they happened a long time ago. Middle Ages Europe apparently had a rash of mass psychogenic incidents, illnesses where people would dance in large groups, sometimes for weeks at a time. The dancing was sometimes accompanied by stripping, howling, the making of obscene gestures, or even, reportedly, laughing or crying to the point of death. That sounds like a rave. Dancing mania was widespread over Europe. For a while, it was a big problem in nunneries, where nuns would make obscene gestures and mew like cats, and priests would have to perform exorcisms to little effect. But who knows what really caused it all these centuries later? A more recent example is the June bug epidemic in a North Carolina textile factory where 60 dressmakers on the same shift, all working in one area of the factory, experienced vomiting, fainting, nausea, and dizziness with no clear physical cause. Researcher Frida Gellin suggested that what was actually contagious was the belief that showing certain characteristics will entitle one to the secondary benefits of the sick role. Then there was a case of contagious laughing sickness in Tanzania that lasted 18 months and affected 1,000 individuals at 14 different schools. At the end of the day, no causative agent was ever found, and investigators concluded that it was a result of stress induced by the recent political independence of the country. The list of reports goes on and on. Each time a causative agent can't be identified, events of this sort are labeled psychogenic, but the absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. So it's hard to tell. What is certain is that humans have a tendency to go with the flow. So it isn't outside the realm of possibility that there's some kind of social spread going on, too. If you've got a lead on anything of the sort, drop us a line in the comments and we'll follow up. Follow the link at the end of the episode to our talk with Dr. Cox about the slow but steady acceptance of these ideas in the mainstream and what he learned while studying Wim Hof, the Iceman who can think his way into wild accomplishments, including conscious control of his inflammatory immune response, one that he can teach other people. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so you catch next week's vid. Give us a like so we can reach more Earthlings in the future. As always, comment below and join us for in-depth discussion on our Facebook group and on Twitter. If you like the show, share it and let us know how to do an even better job next week. There are many scientists who are very skeptic about it, which I can understand because I was very skeptic as well when we started with this whole project. People think it's like kind of pseudoscience and it's like alternative and... 
and we try to get it out of that alternative vibe and more treat it like a physiological reaction and really objectively looking at inflammation and hard endpoints such as these cytokines and I think that was really good although there's still a lot of resistance in the science community against this type of research which I think it's not fair.